This is a video about the management of diabetic ketoacidosis. This video is for medical students, residents, and physicians caring for adult patients with diabetic ketoacidosis. This is an educational video and is not meant to replace clinical judgment or local practice. This video will teach you the pathophysiology of diabetic ketoacidosis, or DKA, how to identify the presenting symptoms and signs of DKA, how to interpret investigations to confirm the diagnosis of DKA, how to develop and implement an appropriate management plan for DKA. You are a senior medical student working an evening shift in the emergency department at a community hospital. The triage nurse asks your team to urgently see the next patient. Meet Sam. Sam is 19 years old and is healthy. He is brought to the hospital by his mother with weakness and confusion. He vomited once in triage. He has been experiencing polyuria, polydipsia and weight loss for approximately one month. Sam's mother has never seen him like this before. Upon initial assessment, Sam is lethargic. His airway is patent with no strider. But he is tachypnic, breathing with deep sighing respirations at a rate of 40 breaths per minute. While his oxygen saturation is 98% on room air, his breath has a fruity odor. Sam is hypotensive with a blood pressure of 88 over 60, and he is tachycardic with a regular pulse of 130 beats per minute. His Glasgow Coma Scale score is 13 and there is no sign of trauma on the primary survey. Initial resuscitation. Sam is placed on cardiac and oxygen saturation monitors. The team obtains large bore intravenous access. A capillary blood sugar level is 26 millimoles per liter, which is very high. What blood tests will you request at this time? Initial investigations. Sam is hyponatremic with a sodium of 126 millimoles per liter. He is hypokalemic with a potassium of 2.9 millimoles per liter. His serum bicarbonate level is low. His serum creatinine is elevated. His hemoglobin A1C, a marker of average blood sugar over the past three months, is high at 8.9%. He has high venous glucose of 21 millimoles per liter, confirming severe hyperglycemia. His serum osmolality is high, but serum lactate is normal. And finally, serum ketones are positive. Arterial blood gas reveals a low pH of 7.05, low partial pressure of carbon dioxide, and a low bicarbonate level. Interpret the blood gas. The pH of 7.05 is in the acidotic range, and the bicarbonate is low, so it is a metabolic acidosis. But the partial pressure of carbon dioxide is also low. This means that SAM is hyperventilating, which is consistent with the tachypnea observed on initial examination. So, SAM has an acute metabolic acidosis with respiratory compensation. When the bicarbonate is low from acidosis, the body tries to compensate by hyperventilating to blow off CO2 and return the pH to normal. After diagnosing metabolic acidosis, your next question should be, is it an anion gap or non-anion gap metabolic acidosis? An anion gap metabolic acidosis is due to the presence of unmeasured anions due to excess acid produced by the body or toxic ingestion of an acid load. The most common causes of a high anion gap metabolic acidosis are diabetic ketoacidosis, lactic acidosis, renal failure, and toxic ingestions. A non-anion gap metabolic acidosis usually results from the loss of bicarbonate from the kidneys or the gastrointestinal tract. 
what is SAM's anion gap? The anion gap is calculated by subtracting serum bicarbonate and chloride from serum sodium. SAM's anion gap is 28, which is very high. Thus, SAM has an anion gap metabolic acidosis. I should note that a drug and alcohol screen was performed in the emergency department and it returned negative. What are your initial thoughts about the case so far? What do you think is the most likely diagnosis? We have a previously healthy 19 year old presenting with decreased level of consciousness, hypovolemia, symptomatic hyperglycemia, high hemoglobin A1C and random blood sugar, acute renal failure, high serum osmolality, and metabolic acidosis. Based on the information you have so far, you make a provisional diagnosis of diabetic ketoacidosis or DKA. DKA is a metabolic emergency that occurs most often in those with type 1 diabetes and those with type 2 diabetes who are experiencing extreme physiologic stress. DKA consists of the biochemical triad of hyperglycemia, ketonemia, and a high anion gap metabolic acidosis. The root cause of DKA is insulin deficiency. Insulin not only lowers blood sugar, it prevents the formation of acidic ketones in the circulation. Without insulin, as occurs in type 1 diabetes, one develops hyperglycemia, ketonemia, and metabolic acidosis. Symptoms of DKA include polyuria, polydipsia, weight loss, abdominal pain, fatigue, vomiting, confusion. Signs of DKA may include deep rapid breathing called Kussmaul's respirations, fruity breath which is a sign of ketones, specifically acetone building in the blood, hypovolemia, decreased level of consciousness. Back to the case. You have just diagnosed Sam with DKA. Blood tests have been obtained and reviewed. Monitors have been placed and intravenous access has been obtained. What is the most appropriate action at this time? A. Start intravenous insulin. B. Start intravenous potassium. C. Start intravenous bicarbonate. D. Give subcutaneous insulin. E. Start oral metformin. The answer is B start intravenous potassium. Was that what you selected? There are many considerations when treating DKA. All of them are important, but each needs to be addressed at the proper time during a patient's clinical course. Preventing and treating hypokalemia or low potassium must be addressed first. The other targets are to treat hypovolemia, treat acidosis, manage hyperosmolality, normalize blood sugar, and finally to identify the precipitant of DKA. Low serum potassium concentration or hypokalemia is one of the most important considerations when treating DKA. In DKA there is a significant deficit in total body potassium. Intracellular shifts with insulin administration and urinary losses can cause severe hypokalemia. This in turn may result in life-threatening cardiac arrhythmia which can lead to death. Here is how I understand how hypokalemia develops when treating DKA. Firstly, insulin is needed to keep potassium inside cells. When the body is deficient of insulin, which again is the root cause of DKA, potassium escapes from cells and moves into the blood and then through the kidneys. And 
along with glucose into the urine and all this happens because of insulin deficiency. During this phase however the serum potassium concentration when measured may appear normal even though the total amount of potassium in the body is very low. Now what happens once we give insulin as we are tempted to do for Sam right now because we are only focused on his hyperglycemia. Well, the insulin will shift whatever potassium remains in the blood back into cells. Potassium concentration in the blood will fall exceptionally quickly and this can be very dangerous since hypokalemia can cause life-threatening cardiac arrhythmia. The key point is that hypokalemia is an avoidable cause of death in DKA. One must resist the urge to immediately infuse insulin when initiating treatment for DKA. Focus on the potassium first. A serum potassium level of 3.3 millimoles per liter is already at the low end of normal. We know for sure that the potassium will plummet to dangerously low levels once we administer insulin. So replace potassium first, even through a central intravenous line if necessary, and then start an insulin infusion. Those with DKA experience profound hypovolemia and may even present with hypovolemic shock. This is a result of the diuresis from hyperglycemia and from vomiting. Use crystalloid intravenous solutions such as normal saline with added potassium as needed. In adults, administer lots of intravenous crystalloid solution. For example, 1 liter bolus, then 500 milliliters per hour for 4 hours, then 250 milliliters per hour. Monitor volume status with physical findings such as jugular venous pressure, pulse rate, blood pressure, and urine output. Also, monitor for clinical signs of fluid overload such as pedal edema and pulmonary inspiratory crackles. Finally, aggressive intravenous fluid hydration has the added benefit of lowering blood sugars. In fact, during the initial management of DKA, it is the intravenous fluids and not the insulin that has a more substantial impact on lowering blood sugars. Treat acidosis. Give intravenous insulin to suppress keto acid production. Use regular human insulin mixed in normal saline or D5W solution. Check capillary blood sugar hourly and adjust the rate of intravenous insulin as the acidosis improves. Follow the anion gap as a marker of acidosis. At this point in the patient's clinical course, we are using insulin to normalize the anion gap. Serum osmolality is the concentration of dissolved particles of chemicals and minerals in the blood, such as sodium and other electrolytes. High serum osmolality means more particles in the blood. Low serum osmolality means the particles are more diluted. Because they are so dehydrated, people presenting with DKA have a high serum osmolality. Fortunately, serum osmolality will fall with the administration of IV fluids. However, rapid reduction of osmolality can lead to cerebral edema, particularly in children, due to the significant shift of fluids into the brain cells. Cerebral edema is a severe complication of diabetes. To minimize the risk of cerebral edema, correct serum osmolality slowly by no more than 3 millimoles per kilogram per hour. Serum osmolality is a function of sodium, glucose and urea concentration. If osmolality is falling too fast, then something must be done to halt the rise in serum sodium or the decline in glucose concentration. One intervention is to use a more hypertonic mm -hmm. intravenous solution with a higher concentration of sodium. Another possibility is to reduce the rate of decline in glucose concentration, which can be accomplished by adding dextrose to the intravenous insulin infusion. Finally ask, why has this happened now? Most often, DKA is the first presentation of type 1 diabetes, 
or occurs in those who already have type 1 diabetes but omit insulin. But other physiologic stressors can lead to DKA, such as infections, myocardial infarction, thyrotoxicosis, drugs and intoxication. Do not miss these severe but treatable conditions that may underlie DKA. Let's go back to Sam's case. He is admitted to the intensive care unit for close monitoring. A central intravenous line is placed and you order cardiac monitoring and frequent vital signs. 40 mil equivalent potassium chloride bolus via the central line. Then intravenous normal saline with 40 mil equivalents potassium chloride per liter running at 500 milliliters per hour for the first few hours. Once serum potassium is over 3.3 millimoles per liter, an intravenous insulin protocol. Finally, you request frequent blood tests to monitor his progress. Keep a flow sheet. It makes it easier to follow a patient's progress and adjust treatment. In Sam's case, intravenous insulin is delayed for one hour to replace his potassium. After six hours, his serum glucose has fallen nearly back to normal, but his anion gap, a marker of acidosis, remains elevated. What would you do? A. Continue intravenous insulin and add dextrose to the solution. B. Stop intravenous insulin. C. Stop intravenous insulin and give subcutaneous insulin. D. Administer sodium bicarbonate. The answer is A. Continue intravenous insulin and add dextrose to the solution. Why is this? Important. Do not stop intravenous insulin until the anion gap has normalized, even if the blood sugar is normal. If insulin is stopped prematurely, acidosis may worsen. Remember, in the early phase of DKA treatment, the insulin treats the acidosis more than the hyperglycemia. But insulin does also help lower blood sugar. So if we continue intravenous insulin, Sam may experience hypoglycemia in the near future. To prevent this, add dextrose to the intravenous infusion. That way, you can continue insulin to treat acidosis but still prevent hypoglycemia. Sam is feeling better. He is transferred out of the intensive care. His anion gap has normalized. His blood sugars have remained steady between 4 and 10 millimoles per liter. He is about to begin eating. Now Sam is ready to transition to subcutaneous insulin. And you can start planning his discharge. How would you transition to subcutaneous insulin? Remember the need to overlap. Intravenous insulin is gone from the system in 20 minutes, but subcutaneous insulin can take a few hours to have an effect. This may lead to a gap and a period of insulin deficiency and rebound acidosis, so overlap the two. Stop intravenous insulin four hours after the first injection of basal insulin, or Stop intravenous insulin two hours after the first injection of rapid insulin. DKA is a metabolic emergency. Treating DKA requires frequent monitoring, prioritizing clinical outcomes at different times during the course of treatment. For example, focus on serum potassium at the beginning or waiting for acidosis to resolve before stopping intravenous insulin. During the first 48 hour, every patient's clinical course is a bit different. This is why it is important to focus on the principles of management. Hopefully this video has taught you the pathophysiology of diabetic ketoacidosis, how to identify the presenting symptoms and signs of DKA, how to interpret investigations to confirm the diagnosis of DKA, how to develop and implement an appropriate management plan for DKA.